but can I also welcome Rachel, Pamela and Sophie who are our panellists today and can I invite you please to, if you have any questions um, for uh, the panel, could you please put them in the Q&A box and I will bring them into the conversation uh, during the chat. So today's topic is, uh, we wanted to look at something that was specific to theatre, but also useful across the board for people wanting to come into creative and cultural jobs. And I think this one really is applicable to anybody, but I think it's a nice um, route in theatre. And it is three key pillars to success in theatre. Capitalise on luck, be able to diversify and be able to fill your boots. Rock up and explore these concepts with our expert panellists. And our panellists today are Sophie Sims, who works for the producer Michael McCabe on the West End productions of Prince of Egypt and Wicked. Rachel Darcy, who is the founder of Crossfade Theatre and Digital and Communications Officer at the National Theatre of Scotland. And Pamela McQueen, a dramaturg. Currently, Pamela is project lead and dramaturg for the Baptiste programme in Smock Alley Theatre, Dublin. And you're all very welcome today. So what I'd like to start with is um, who you are and what you do and a little bit about yourself. So I'm just going to start at the top right hand corner of the screen and work my way around. And that lucky person to start is you, Rachel. <laughs> Great. Um, well, hi, I'm Rachel Darcy. I'm the Digital and Communications Officer at the National Theatre of Scotland, as Anne said. Um, in my current role, I'm responsible for overseeing and managing the digital digital communications at the National Theatre, um, managing our social media across multiple platforms. Um, I've previously worked with the Citizens Theatre, with the Corner Shop PR, um, and those were in press and marketing roles. And I also worked as a training producer with Payne's Plough. Um, I graduated from the University of Glasgow's Inlet in Theatre Studies in 2014. Thank you. Pamela? Hi, uh, I'm Pamela McQueen. I'm a dramaturg and you can probably tell from my accent, I'm Irish. So I came over to Glasgow to the uni to do the Masters in Dramaturgy and Playwriting course. Um, I've been working in theatre for about 21 years. I initially, for about seven years after my undergraduate, was a technical person. So I was doing a lot of stage and production management in the world of new plays and then sort of moved sideways through working with literary departments into being a dramaturg where my specialism is working with playwrights on new plays and doing adaptations of texts into new plays. So I've been uh, the associate dramaturg at the Tron Theatre after I graduated from my master's in Glasgow. I was there for about three, three, four years. I've been the associate dramaturg with uh, the new play, the new theatre in Dublin for three or four years. So that's venue work. I also do a lot of um, independent sector work, working directly with playwrights. More recently, that's become a series of mentorships and continuing professional development roles with playwrights moving between forms and upskilling. And then I also uh, more recently have worked a lot in diversity. So I work with um, a company called Arts and Disability Ireland. Um, with various different playwrights who um, identify as disabled. And I also, as Anne was saying, run the Baptiste programme, which is specifically for Black Irish theatre makers who are moving into playwriting. Fabulous. Thank you, Pamela. And Sophie? Hi, I'm Sophie Sims. Um, I actually started out going to drama school and leaving Guildford School of Acting with a degree in musical theatre um, and found myself completely by accident working for a big marketing agency in London who led on campaigns for some of the top West End musicals and plays. Um, and from there, I found myself uh, heading up the Department for Content and Digital Marketing. And I still work with um, one of those clients now, which is Michael McCabe, the producer of Wicked and the Prince of Egypt. Um, and so I work very closely with him on running all of the digital campaigns across both shows. Fabulous. So going back to the original topic, um, is looking at these three key pillars to success and working in theatre. And even in your introductions, I can hear every single one of you personifying exactly what's in there. But I think what I'd like to do is take one pillar 
per panellist and just get you to come in on that particular one. So we'll start with you, Rachel. And the first key pillar to success in theatre is to be able to capitalise on luck. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, well, I think luck has been definitely a key aspect of my career journey um, to the point where the first show I worked on at Payne's Plough was called With a Little Bit of Luck. Um, so um, I think that's a good example because I initially applied for a trainee administrator role with Payne's Plough. Um, but after the first interview, they contacted me to say, we think you're a better fit for a trainee producer role, which I had ruled myself out of. I didn't think I had the experience and I didn't think that I was ready for that kind of um, that kind of role. So I would say don't rule yourself out of opportunities. Um, it was pure luck that they decided to mention it to me and I kind of hummed and hawed, should I? I don't know. And then I realised I was being given an amazing opportunity. So I had to pursue it and just see what would happen. And I think it's a good example of, because I'd ruled myself out, um, I, because I felt like I didn't fit all the criteria, but just having a look at criteria on jobs and even if you feel like you don't fit, thinking about how you, the skills you do have can be maximised. Um, and then also showing a willingness to learn either in your application or during the interview process, because that you can end up like me being extremely lucky. How do you think, Rachel, you can create luck? You know, like, do you think you can create opportunities for yourself or is it pure, pure luck? Definitely, I think you can create luck. I think that um, there are lots of free online training courses. So um, some examples would be Google, LinkedIn and Facebook. They all offer free training courses. So if you're looking at those and kind of keeping your skills up to date, it's not necessarily about creating luck, but making yourself as ready as you can be when that right opportunity comes up to be able to say, OK, I know that I've got experience and I've, I've done training that allows me to, to do this. So it's about constantly refreshing what you know and kind of keeping an eye on what's going on in the industry, whether that be theatre, whether that be TV, publishing, anywhere. Um, so in those ways, you can create a sense of luck for yourself, um, but you, you can be strategic about it. Yeah. Future Learn is another good resource for small free courses. Um, and I've seen a lot of students going there uh, over the last year as well. Pamela or Sophie, would either of the two of you like to comment on this idea of capitalizing and creating luck? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, what do they say about luck again? It's the being in the right place at the right moment, isn't it? Um, so I think for me I've had some extraordinarily lucky moments in my career and it's because I have gone out meeting with people to be in the place at the moment so I can tell you a really extraordinary piece of luck happened actually when I was in Glasgow I went when I first arrived I did an internship at the Playwright Studio of Scotland just to get to know the whole industry and I just sent off emails and went and had cups of coffee with people and one of the person I had a cup of coffee with was Andy Arnold who was running the arches at the time who then happened to be doing a season of Irish work or planning for one that I didn't know about and I happened to be the Irish person walking in his door so just sheer luck from the sense of having sent out an email you know to say hello and do a meet and greet and even from that there was kind of a timing moment where then we'd established a kind of a working relationship. We did um, a couple of plays, um, one at the sits and one in the arches. And then he went on to get a job as artistic director at the Tron and needed to program that very quickly and was very interested in new work, uh, new playwrights and doing new plays as part of that. And so that started a conversation where out of which I became the associate dramaturg while I was also simultaneously doing the Masters in Dramaturgy at the same time. <laughs> but, had so, you, Pamela, but had you not put those feelers out and had all those cups, like you weren't in response to a job, you weren't in response to a particular thing that was being made, you know, it's like, had you not created that environment, it would have went to somebody else, yeah. some other Irish oh, person. <laughs> ab absolutely. And it's so, it's just, it's that thing where you were there at the right moment because you'd started to put out the feelers and, you know, I suppose that awful word that people use, you know, the idea of networking, but 
sometimes it's just as simple as having a cup of coffee with somebody, you know. Sophie. Yeah, I, I completely agree with everything that, that you both said. I had a very similar experience in that I decided not to continue my career as an actor, but I still wanted to work in the industry. And it's not taught at drama school. It, it, we're not taught about all the other departments that, that bring together a, a production. So I had no idea. I don't know who I thought was was doing the marketing campaigns but it, it was just happening um, and I did exactly that I spoke to a friend whose husband worked at the Society of London Theatre and said I don't suppose he's got any jobs going there you know I'll, I'll be a receptionist I'll start at the bottom he was like I'll, I'll ask I'll ask and about three days later he said Julian hasn't but my friend David at this big marketing agency has um, the deadlines tomorrow and as an actor I had no CV for for office work or anything so I sort of hurriedly put something together and got the job and I think I always think back and think if I hadn't have texted my friend and just said oh look you know and it was a real flippant you know I was not expecting anything to come back from it so as horrible as that word it's who is, is it it's not who you know I don't want to say it, but who you know, not what you know. You've got to have the skills in place, of course, but networking is certainly for me and from the experience I have with other people in the industry is the biggest part of it. And getting your name out there, being being known is, is really important. And I always think students, especially um, students looking at creative industry or coming from an arts background, the word networking is just like, really, oh, it's, oh that sounds like, that sounds like torture, it sounds awful. But I mean, I always think about networking as, you know, just chatting to folk, being friendly, and who are you, what do you do, helps very much in networking if you're nosy which I am, <laughs> you know, so, oh, who are you? What do you do? That's really interesting. And, oh, can I connect with you? Or, oh, do you know, I have a friend that knows, if, oh, do you know, that, that, that'd be good. Like, to me, that's networking. It's just, like, chatting to folk and, you know, like, when you see them out and about or when you on social media or on LinkedIn or the dots, all these kind of places where you can just chat to folk and ask questions of them. Um, okay, so second pillar is diversify. Now, I'm already hearing so much diversification from all of you, but I'm going to go to you, Pamela, because you think you possibly had the longest list of diversified oh. <laughs> <laughs> when you were of activities when you were introducing yourself. So tell us a bit about being able to diversify and why do you think that's important in theatre? Yeah, well, I think it's for my role it's quite important because one of the things is about working across different forms um and of theater and genres of playwriting do you know so um i think initially before you get into diversification from my point of view one of the reasons why i did the masters is i wanted to kind of solidify a set of skills that i already had so i would have for example um had done six years on the script reading panel in the Abbey when I was also working as a stage manager before I went to do the masters and I was producing um, smaller kind of fringe studio new plays so for me then the masters was an opportunity to kind of solidify a set of skills and then I had a, felt I had a confidence in presenting a set of skills for employers you know and then once I felt I had that down to a degree I felt I could look at different areas where I could apply that skill set do you know so then for example just thinking of one of the things now at the moment I do a kind of mentorship in um, site-specific and immersive theatre but that for me would have started as a piece of practice when I did a uh, play with uh, Cora Bissett and Steph Smith um, as part of that work at the Tron which was Roadkill which was produced off-site so I started practicing in that area learning about it and then actually kind of studying it for a little while as well to then sort of branch into that area of theatre in terms of being a dramaturg and working with playwrights and artists, you know, as a kind of specialism in that area, if you like. And I suppose more, more laterally, um, in a kind of more up-to-date way, um, 
I'm currently in a couple of, uh, I have a couple of bursaries from my own practice and I'm working with mentors in the field of disability arts and with the International Dramaturgs Lab and with the Festival Cross, Cross, Crossing the Line because in recent years, that's an area that I've started my practice in. So I want to make sure I'm kind of like up to speed in the most current activities in that field, do you know, the most current debates in that field. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, so. yeah. In, a very, in, in a very sort of roundabout manner, but I think that's that that's par for the course, isn't it? It's like all these little jigsaw pieces making up like the full complete of what you do. Rachel and Sophie, either of you like to comment on that idea of why it's important to diversify and how you can diversify in theatre? Um, yeah, I can, I can take a stab at it. <laughs> Um, I think kind of what I was saying earlier about always kind of keeping on top of training and, and free opportunities to do that. Um, but I also think that um, a lot of the soft skills that you learn just by working in theatre, so communication and collaboration, those are skills that can sit in a variety of roles. Um, I kind of related, Sophie, to what you were saying about not knowing particularly about the marketing side of theatre, particularly when I was at school it wasn't really until I got to university that I kind of started to understand that there were there were many many branches to the industry um so I think that um kind of having an awareness of that and knowing that you know I started in producing which is a very very broad depending on where you're working you can be doing all sorts of things from budgeting all the way through to being the person that's making the creative content um and then you know from that I kind of realized that wasn't so much a fan of the budgeting but I did enjoy the creative side so then went into the press and marketing and chatting people's ear off about theatre um which I'm <laughs> which I really enjoyed um and so from there um I got the experience that allowed me to figure out where my skill set set was and where I felt most comfortable in order to get me to the role that I wanted but it took me taking lots of opportunities and trying out lots of different things to get to that point. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to move on to the third question uh, for you, Sophie, which is this concept of being able to fill your boots. So whenever something comes at you, this bit of luck comes at you, and it's like, oh, Rachel, we're not going to offer you that job. We're going to offer you this job. <gasps> or, oh, yeah, I can add tomorrow, Sophie, for that thing. <laughs> okay right uh so that kind of concept something coming at you and you the oh my god this this is an opportunity for me and I really need to like you use the term about getting your name out there so building your reputation Sophie and it's like so when something does come at you what's the right attitude how do you fill your boots in it I it's so hard to explain I don't I, it's built in me so when I get an opportunity you know even if I'm absolutely terrified about what this might mean there is something in me that can't let it go and I don't really ever remember turning a job down ever in my life um I mean, that might mean that I haven't had many, many um, offers, but um, I think, I think see, what Rachel was saying about soft skills, if you can talk to people and you're, um, you're open to ideas and learning, that's really, I think, the, the fundamentals to, to any position, any job, I think. Um, showing that you can be directed or led or guided um, and so with that with that in mind and taking those skills with you there's nothing really that if you have a, a true passion and an interest in a specific subject you have to just it sounds all you have to just go for it I had no experience of marketing I had a I had a degree in musical theatre I mean they did not ask me to pirouette in that meeting room they were asking me about marketing campaigns and actually I just took what I did know so okay I've seen all of the shows that you work on and I loved this about the show and this about the show okay well that that was showing me as an audience member so if I can relate to the audience 
and I can also relate to the actors because I've been there. Those are two huge things that somebody who has been to university and studied marketing might not be able to do that. So I think it's all of these pillars together that then build up your confidence, I think, to just go for it when you do get the opportunity. What kind of personality type, Rachel, do you think it takes to, to be able to, um, you know, so when you were offered the job that was not the one that you'd went for, you know, what kind of personality, I think it's a certain personality type that is able to do that? Um, well, I've worked with a lot of different personality types, so I don't think there's one specific set. I think that um, it's about having a, a balance and a variety of, of personalities. Um for me, I know that I, I realised quite early on, as much as I loved theatre, I did not want to be an actor. <laughs> so I would say that my personality type's a bit more introverted, um, but that I have that those sort of like intuitive aspects that help me relate and they um, convert that into text. So that would then become marketing copy or a press release and things like that. Um, and I know that there are very extroverted people that work behind the scenes as well and who are able to kind of, you know, do interviews with, with creatives and performers that get a lot out of them on camera. So I think it's, um, I don't think there's any one particular personality, but I think you can, you can um, find your skills. Um, I actually, I did that personality test online the other day to kind of um, identify strengths and weaknesses. So that's a, an interesting thing to do. Um, just so that you can kind of figure that out about yourself if you're not quite sure. Yeah. And Pamela, can I ask you then, sort of on, on the same topic, but slightly different perspective, um, what advice would you give to a student that suddenly finds himself, um, they've been out, they've capitalised on luck, something's came their way, um, that's something that they've not done before, so they're diversifying, and now they're in the position of, I have to rock up somewhere tomorrow and I have to fill my boots in this. What advice would you give them to make a success of it? Uh, um, find, lots of things. Find out as much as you can in advance. So whether that's about the particular role, like what is the role, who's doing it, where is it being done? And then ask people who are doing the role, maybe in other institutions or with other companies, um, any tips and advice they can give you and then also just kind of see what you can bring to that from your own area, you know, your own practice, your own expertise, what's the matches, you know? I think in, in almost any job you do, you look back over what you've done previously and you kind of go, right, well, I know about this area of the job or I know about this particular thing that happens on a Monday morning, do you know what I mean? And so you sort of play to your strengths initially and then, hopefully a little bit, a few days into the job, you'll find out what some of your weaknesses are and then you'll be able to kind of gen up on those quite quickly to kind of support the strength that you've already demonstrated. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to move now to, um, I spent longer in that discussion because I actually thought it was really valuable. So I'm going to move now to some of the students' questions. So first of all, can you become a dramaturg without having studied? dramaturgy. I am so drawn to this role but at university I've studied English literature. Pamela. Ah um, well interestingly like uh, I did English and history as my primary degree as well so I think if you have done drama as part of your English degree you will have done a certain amount of uh, hopefully analysis of play texts mm -hmm. which will give you a certain amount of dramaturgical kind of understanding how plays are put together which can be a useful set of skills for you to apply then in terms of the process of making a play you know um i would say yes you can to a degree as in you can perhaps do smaller shows or um approach people who are starting out themselves and an emerging artist and working the, with them in that kind of collegiate role as a dramaturg and then it's more if you want to sort of grow a career and maybe um sort of look at exp expanding that to you know, a larger scale work and specific areas as well of work that you kind of look at, you know, specific training in dramaturgy. Because if you dig into the courses that are available at universities, um, the modules that they will offer will indicate to you different specialisms that you can look into as a dramaturg. For example, when I say I'm a new play dramaturg, um, you know, there are people who are 
solely Shakespearean dramaturgs or only ever work on classic texts, or there's also people who focus on um, adaptation. So they adapt books and films only for the stage, you know? So it depends where you want to take your career as a dramaturg, the kind of qualification that you'll look for, you know? Thank you for that, Pamela. And Olivia has asked, I would love to work in theatre, but as an English literature and history of art student, I'm not sure where I would fit in any advice things. And I think this is irrespective of your first degree. Um, this is a question about where you can get information to understand the different roles that sit within the theatre industry. Because there's the three of you all work in the same sector, but you're all doing totally different things yeah. within it. So um, where would a student go to find out about the different roles that are within theatre so that they can start to sort of think about where their fit is? There are a few, oh, sorry. No, no, you're ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I think there are a few different, it, I, I think it depends on where you're looking to which sort of, um, area you're looking into. I spent a lot of time researching and looking on the Society of London Theatre website because they sort of are quite broad across. They also have a, a sister site called UK Theatre, which is more regional UK theatres. Um, and there's quite a lot of information on there. They also have a programme called Stage One, which is for producers um, or, or emerging young producers. So um, there are websites out there. I wouldn't have a clue where to start looking for drama positions, but um, maybe Pamela could tell us that. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say something very similar to that, Sophie, about kind of resource organisations. I remember when I was um, kind of unclear way back then in the beginning, I looked at a thing which is over here in Ireland, which is the Irish Theatre Institute and the Theatre Forum. But I know in Scotland there's something similar, which is the Federation of Scottish theatre I think if, I'm, if I remember the name rightly and they were just fascinating websites to me because they list so many of the different roles um, and the practitioners you know so even just to get a sense of what the titles are and then in relation to I suppose dramaturgy proper there's a few um, discipline specific, specific organizations so there's Dramaturgs Network UK where you can log on and learn more about the different functions and processes of dramaturgy and different people who are doing the job as well. Um, and I know, I'm sure there's similar things I know for directors as the Directors Guild and, um, you know, Designers Guilds and things like that. If you want to sort of look more deeply into one specific profession, you know. There's also what I found really useful was a website called MGC Futures, uh, which was set up by Michael Grandage. And there's a section on that all about careers and they have interviews with a lot of people that do different roles in theatre um, and also I found when I went to the theatre I would always buy my programme and have a leaflet and look through the back and that was how I learned about a lot of the different names of different types of roles so that's another thing if you're going to the theatre regularly when we could um, <laughs> then, um, then that's a good place to look as well. I love that piece of advice, Rachel. So put a little link up there onto website prospects that takes you through to, now I know you're, you're all doing different subjects, you're not doing drama, but that takes you through to some of the breakdown of jobs that sit within drama and theatre. So it's a good way to get you started and it takes you out to lots of other places um, along the lines of what Rachel, Sophie and Pamela are referring you to. But I love that bit of advice and it's the same as we would tell people that are interested in television and film, look at the credits. Look at look at the, just look at the credits and you'll break down all the jobs and you'll get a list of all the contacts and it's exactly the same. Go to the theatre, get the program, <laughs> you know, fetch up that extra fiber and you'll uh, have a ready list of contacts there. Now we have one final question, um, and we'll go to this and then we will wrap it up. And the final question is. I am trying to get into screen acting and I have a question in regards to getting your name out there and reputation. Would you say that it is better to be in a film that does not do well or to not be in it at all? Is it better to have that experience or not have your name associated with a film or show that is not very good or the other actors are not very good? So, so which, is, which is better, do you think? <laughs> That's really hard because... Um, Who's a pit like a pit? Um, I always think that 
the success of a show obviously is based on lots of opinions being the same but um if if you get something out of it you could get um you could get something for your show reel which maybe doesn't have to have any of the other actors in but if you're good then yeah. you can take that clip and it and it's it's a credit it's learning i would I would be so bold as to say it's experience and you never know who you might meet on that job um, who might help you in the future. That's my opinion. <laughs> I agree. And you could always give something, you know, you could talk about it and you say, well, it wasn't very good. You say, well, what would you have done better? And you, oh, well, I would have put this and I would have cast that person. <laughs> and it sort of shows that you're understanding of it, I suppose. So thank you very, very much, Rachel, Pamela and Sophie and the students for um, coming along to the talk and putting your student or your questions in. It's been very interesting. I'm going to um, finish up with just one last run around each of you to ask you for a final word, a top tip, a word of wisdom, if I could go back and talk to myself at that stage. Uh, so what would your final word on the subject be, Rachel? Um, I would say, say yes to it as much as you can, but balance that with taking care of yourself. Yes. Um, you'll work your best when you've taken the time to relax, rest and recharge. Thank you for that. Sophie? Stop trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future and look at what's happening right now. And that sort of ties into Rachel's, I think, in that um, if you're focused too far in the future about what the end goal is, you kind of miss all the stuff on the journey to get there. Thank you, Sophie. Pamela? Great advice. Um, be brave, jump in with both feet and you're much more likely to swim than you are to sink. <laughs> thank you lovely advice from all of you thank you very very much it's been a pleasure speaking to all of you meeting all of you um and uh thanks to the students and that's it from me so cheerio thank, thank you, you so much. thanks Bye. for having Bye. us Bye.